like this. Order. Foreign Secretary, could I begin by welcoming you again most warmly to this committee and thanking you during your busy schedule for taking time to come and be with us. Um, I think uh, your two colleagues, perhaps I could I just ask you to introduce them, I think they're known to us. Uh, Michael J, Mr. Peter Ricketts. Thank you very much farmers. indeed. Um, I think, uh, as you know, Foreign Secretary, this uh, afternoon session has become part of a, uh, a fairly regular event the committee tries to adhere to, which is to seek uh, to share your thoughts prior to each regular European Council meeting. And there is such a regular Council meeting just about to come up uh, in Rome on the 14th of December, um, although it may lead to s s some patterns of events which are by no means regular, but we'll see about that. So could we thank you very much for your memorandum, which was prepared before your Foreign Affairs Council meeting yesterday, and indeed before the um, Conference of European Community Parliaments in Rome, which was attended by some members of this committee, which took place last week and also addressed itself to um, the same sort of issues. And, and could we perhaps begin by um, Looking at, what, uh, looking at what you feel the main issues are going to be on the agenda of the European Council. Now, I ask that uh, knowing from your useful memorandum that, according to Mr Andriotti, the main issues are indeed going to be the Intergovernmental Conference on Political Union uh, and presumably the other Intergovernmental Conference to a lesser extent, um, and that this, the two IGCs, to begin in Rome on the 15th of December, the next day, will, t will tend to crowd the agenda. I think the first question, therefore, from us is, is that the right set of priorities, or might one not now expect a rather higher place on the agenda for such issues as the uh, breakdown of the GATT talks, or threatened breakdown, which much concerned you yesterday, I believe, uh, the looming scene in the Gulf, and the uh, looming crisis in the Soviet Union, which threatens to destabilise once again the whole of Eastern Europe. I think that's right, Mr. Chairman. I think the uh, three main items, so far as one can foresee them at the moment, and indeed as emerged from our discussions yesterday in the Foreign Affairs Council, will be the Gulf, where it must be right that the heads of state and government should look. Uh, carefully at the situation and decide what voice they're going to raise following the uh, Security Council resolution 678 last week and the initiative of the President of the United States. Secondly, the Soviet Union, where it is clear that the uh, European Commission, working, I'm glad to say, very closely with the IMF, will be producing ideas, proposals, in the course of next week for help for the Soviet Union. I would think also we should be discussing uh, Central and Eastern Europe, the countries and the, the economic plight of those countries, because I think those are two dossier, two subjects, uh, both of which will need to be addressed, but certainly the first one. Uh, the GATT talks, it may be, of course that will depend, as you've said, on the course of the discussions this week. Um, it may or may not be true that the European Council is the best place to uh, provide a, a, an impetus if an impetus is needed. I think that remains to be considered. On the two IGCs, my strong impression is that the presidency, for good reasons, does not particularly want to have a, uh, another um, substantial discussion on the economic and monetary union. Uh, I would guess that that IGC will start, as you say, on the last afternoon, its first working session. Um, without a great deal of further preparation, because so much preparation has been done. I think there will certainly be discussion on the, on the other IGC, the, the political union one, on which we spent a good deal of time uh, yesterday morning. And 
and uh, you may want to pursue those, uh, pursue that particular matter further. I think those will be the main subjects. Well, I think we would like to pursue this further, but perhaps just some general questions first. Mr. Rowlands. Yes, sir. I'm somewhat relieved that at least you believe very firmly that you will be able to establish an order of priority, uh, that the European Council will deal with the very serious issues that emerge in not only the Soviet Union but in Eastern Europe. The effect of the Gulf War on oil prices, on the disruption of traditional trading patterns with Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland do really threaten very seriously progress, both economic and political, in those countries. Will you be able to get a degree of consensus and support at the European Council for real progress, immediate help and assistance, instruments of credit to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union out, uh, uh, on the 14th of December? Or will it get pushed aside by the, uh, the, uh, the, the IGC issues? Although I think Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union both need to be considered, they are rather different. In Eastern Europe, we have uh, an instrument, the Group of 24, which is uh, led by the European Commission, but includes the United States, includes Japan, um, and uh, which uh, we certainly regard as the main instrument for carrying help to the countries of Eastern Europe. It's proved itself able to do that before. I think it is the right instrument. I think it needs to work very closely with the world uh, Bank and the IMF. Um, they are the people who are best qualified to make a, an assessment of, what, of need, and the group of 24 disposing of all those resources, um, rather than just the community's resources, are the best people to bring the help. I would add to that the Gulf states, who um, have, um, uh, through no, I mean, who, who've achieved quite substantial increases in revenue. Achieved is the wrong word because it's happened, uh, but they are substantially better off uh, because of the rise in the, uh, in the uh, world price of oil. And the countries of Eastern Europe are substantially worse off through exactly the same thing. So I believe that their resource is also needed to help with the problems of Eastern Europe. So it, I, don't think the, I would be, don't think the European Council itself would take decisions on Eastern Europe because it isn't just the resources of the European community which are involved, but I'm sure they will want to give an impetus. And, can and as regards the Soviet Union, it is different, because there you have a country which will actually benefit substantially from the rise in the price of oil, and whose problem is not one of a basic shortage of resources, um, but a basic uh, breakdown of distribution, whether you're talking about energy, or whether you're talking about uh, food, or whether you're talking about manufacturers. So that's a different problem, where we will certainly have a report from President Delors the Commission is working very hard on this with the IMF, and I would guess, but it's only a guess, that there will be decisions there on, on, on at least the, the, what are regarded as the more urgent um, aspects of help for the Soviet Union. Can a group of 24 act swiftly on the European, Eastern European Sea? Yes. And there is a meeting scheduled uh, between now and Christmas. There is a, a meeting, that's right, there's a, there is a G24 meeting today and there's an emergency, an exceptional meeting of finance ministers of the community on, uh, on Monday. But the G24 has shown that it can act quickly. Well, I think if time allows, we'd like to come back to some of those issues in more detail, possibly not the oil one, not least because as is a world glut of oil, I expect the problem will be a low price role and a high one, but that's another issue. Uh, having dealt with the agenda itself, perhaps we could now turn following your invitation, to a number of specific items and indeed begin with the question of the political union IGC and the timing machine. Mr. Bowen Walsh. Um, Prime Secretary, as you know, the, the way in which the agenda is set um, for European councils is uh, crowded from our view. And you have given us four uh, main items of discussion. But uh, weren't the, wasn't the agenda... Uh, set, at least initially anyway, or outlined uh, in the Rome summit that uh, was a sort of additional summit that took place uh, a month ago. The, the, the agenda of a, of, a, of a summit is really set by the presidency and um, we are awaiting the final confirmation of the agenda from the presidency's representative visiting Mr. Tatani, who will be visiting London uh, later this week. Um, so he will bring an up-to-date idea of what uh, Senior Andriotti, how he wants to uh, um, organize the, um, 
Council, but we had a pretty clear indication from the Italian Foreign Minister yesterday in the chair of our meeting, and uh, the, the, the uh, items I've given were the items which he gave, with the question mark over the uh, usefulness of a discussion on GATT, which was a question mark in his mind. And what decisions do you think the European Council will come to? <coughs> I think that uh, on the Gulf there will be, I hope there will be, there should be, a, uh, a declaration, the voice of the 12, uh, supporting, I would hope, both the Security Council resolution, for which, of course, Britain and France voted in New York last week, uh, authorising, if need be, the uh, use of force, uh, and also the initiative of the President of the United States to go, as he put it, the extra mile for peace during the pause of goodwill which is the Security Council resolution has created. I'm sure that the European community, the 12, ought to put particular emphasis on the question of hostages, since uh, several, several members, including ourselves, have a large number of hostages in uh, Iraq and Kuwait. <coughs> on the GATT, I think it's, it depends entirely on what happens this week. Uh, on, I think I've answered on the Soviet Union, the EC, and the Eastern Europe. As regards the IGC on political union, um, my worry our way has been lest an attempt should be made, another attempt should be made, to write the conclusions of the IGC before the IGC is beginning to do This has never seemed to us a very sensible way of proceeding, and, uh, but I am encouraged by the way the discussions went yesterday to, to hope that that will not actually uh, happen on this occasion. On political union, um, during a recent um, public discussions um, concerned with the leadership of the Conservative Party, um, you had proposed that it might be sensible for Her Majesty's Government to prepare a policy document on these subjects, particularly political union as we understand it. Um, if so, when are you preparing it and if so, when will it be ready uh, and uh, how do you see the likely timing of the whole process? Well, my, my idea, which was of course a personal one uh, in that context, um, was not confined to political union. Um, it, it was that it would be sensible for um, the party, the government, to pull together, I think I used this expression on, on one occasion, to pull together the threads of its policy and set them out in, in a way which everyone could see and which I believe the great majority of the party could uh, adhere to. So it wasn't confined to the IGC or to the summit. We're concentrating in the next um, 10 days on getting our tackle ready for the, uh, uh, for the summit and indeed for the start of the two IGCs. And uh, I'm anxious in particular, because it's my particular concern, to get our tackle ready for the start of the IGC on political union, and in particular on the questions of foreign and security defence policy, which you may want to come on to, which I regard as the heart of the IGC on political union. But personally, I've not uh, uh, lost sight of the idea of a, of a published document which draws together our whole policy towards the uh, community. Uh, the actual form and date of that has not yet been uh, decided. It became very clear to those of us who were attending the uh, conference in Rome of the national uh, parliaments of the European Parliament that this country really did need to be brought up to date with what is being discussed in Europe and for a discussion to be promoted in this country on these issues. So it would seem to me as one member of the committee that the sort of discussion document that you had been talking about is very much needed. Well, we have a debate tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, on precisely this issue, at least it's not precisely the issue, but uh, I propose in leading the debate and mm. starting the debate to concentrate yes. on, the, on the issues which will come up in this particular IGC. Yeah. There will be other occasions, it seems to me, when the Economic and Monetary Union uh, has been discussed, will be discussed. Uh, but I, I I'll agree with you, Mr. Wales, I think the, uh, uh, the need now is to produce some focus on the, on the, the second IGC, the political union one. And that's what I shall concentrate on tomorrow. Now, does, can I ask you, just press you a little further, do, do, does Her Majesty's Government accept that the concept of European Union is more than just the effectiveness of the EC uh, institutions, 
uh, the Rome October Summit spoke of developing the European community's political dimension, strengthening its capacity for action and extending its powers with a UK reservation to other supplementary sectors. And so what does Her Majesty's Government take European Union to mean? Well, I wouldn't say so. I just see it, but it's a Humpty Dumpty term. I mean, it doesn't mean what you, what you want it to mean. Uh, it's a term of in infinite uh, elasticity. Um, and uh, I don't think the IGC would be very well advised to start its discussions by trying to define the term. Um, what it will in fact turn out, because we, we start from where we are, what it will turn out to be is a review, sector by sector, of where uh, movement is possible and desired. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've indicated one sector, foreign and security policy, which I think is both more important and uh, more open to progress than the others. But that's what it will be uh, under this heading of uh, political union. That's, that's what act will actually happen with the unanimity rule applied, i.e. Uh, change has to be announced. Yeah. I'm not the issue is whether, in due course, oh. Europe becomes a federation or whether it becomes a union of nation states not federated. And the argument that um, has taken place recently, and particularly during the time of the leadership um, contest, was whether uh, one side was likely to move more quickly towards a, a federal system than the other side. Now, the answer that was always given was that uh, we in Britain have no intention, no wish, no desire, and we will resist any move towards a federal state. But as uh, Bowen Wells said, and he attended, there was a meeting of the Conference of the Parliaments of the European Community in Rome between the 27th and the 30th of November, which said in one of its declarations that they welcomed what had already been achieved while seeking to remodel the community into a European Union on a federal basis and to provide it with the appropriate institutions. Can I take it that Her Majesty's go government is totally, utterly, and completely opposed to such declaration? We certainly do not accept that the end of all these discussions is a federal Europe with a central structure at the centre and the present nation states becoming parts of a federation in the same way that the land are part of, the, of Germany or the states of the United States are part of the United States. We don't believe in a glacier. We don't believe in something inevitable that when you become a member of the European community, you climb on a glacier, which, at whatever pace, inevitably, inexorably, leads you to the open sea of a federal state. We don't accept that. We believe that any movement has to be judged as to its usefulness. It's not inevitable. Um, that any movement has to be looked at on its merits. There may be areas in my view, there certainly are areas where the European states should work much more closely together than they do now. It doesn't necessarily follow that that cooperation should be in the form of community institutions. The whole area I've talked up before, the whole uh, home office area, drugs and policing, I believe we are only at the beginning of the Europeanization of this work. But I don't mean by that that it necessarily has to be put under the existing treaties and the existing institutions. There are other areas which are already part of the community institutions, the community competence. And these matters should be judged on the usefulness. The whole doctrine of subsidiarity, which we, you may want to go up to, is an attempt in its infancy, an attempt to find a way of judging what are the areas where the uh, community should act as a community, what are the areas where the community should act cooperatively, and what are the areas where, where it's best left to nation states to carry on? Well, can, can I just follow um, up on that last answer, Chairman? The, um, one of the purposes of the IGCs is conceived to be 
to move towards a situation where more decisions taken by the European Union, however defined, are taken by majority and fewer by veto. If the majority view of the countries in Europe is to move ever closer by whatever stages to federalism, and then that view is underpinned by the institutional requirement of a majority decision and no veto, isn't it inevitable, however you, you state it, and I yield to no man in my admiration for the way you state these things, inevitable that uh, we will move towards a federal system. No, the only thing that will stop that is if the majority of the countries governments in Europe do not want a federal system, and that seems not yeah. to be so. Mr. Lawrence, you're a lawyer. You know the treaties. You know the treaties can only be changed if everybody accepts a change. And uh, that's what I mean, they proceed by unanimity. Uh, what we're talking about, what the IGC is about, technically, are occasions or means of changing the treaties. It's different in the EMU one because there is theoretically, although not, I think, in practice, the possibility of a completely separate treaty on that subject. On the IGC on political union, there's no such possibility. We're talking about the possibility of changing the existing treaties, the existing institutions. And that requires unanimity. So there's nothing inevitable. There is nothing of the glacier about the way in which these decisions are taken or the way in which the community evolves. Uh, Mr. Lawrence will be reassured to know that at least some of the members of Parliament attending this conference to which he refers withheld their support from this yes. uh, rather heavily federalist document. But it has to be recorded, as far as the Secretary will know, that, of course, the vast majority of the uh, parliamentarians of Europe, if that's the right phrase, and the various national parliaments were of the other persuasion. And uh, therefore, an overwhelming majority were in favour of the whole document, which goes a very long way towards setting up a federal government for Europe. Um, that's at the parliamentary level. Could I ask you, Florence, actually, whether at the governmental level, or where at the governmental, you think that calmer and uh, more analytical minds might support the view that the British have taken about not wanting to rush into a federal structure? Well, I think if you look at the, at the work which has, been gone, which has gone on, the work of the special representatives preparing for the uh, IGC on political union, you will see the different strands there. Uh, I mean, the French approach is to magnify the role of the European Council. They like the European Council. They see that as the overarching authority and would give it very substantial uh, extra authority. They prefer that to giving powers, extra powers, to the European Parliament or to the European Commission. The German approach, for, for reasons we all understand, is not yet fully articulated, but I think from everything that Chancellor Kohl has said, and probably what you found at the uh, seas in Rome, the German approach is rather the other, uh, to accentuate the role of the European Parliament and uh, perhaps of the Commission, rather than the role of the Council of Ministers and of the European <coughs> Council. Uh, our approach, which you may want to, to elaborate in further, in further detail, is not to go down the path of extra competence, or extra qualified majority voting to encourage the European Parliament into the path of monitoring, examining, checking uh, what the, uh, how the Commission uh, uses its authority and its resources, uh, building up the role of national parliaments vis-a-vis -vis the uh, Council of Ministers, making progress certainly in this field of foreign and security policy, trying to strengthen the European uh, pillar of Western defence, although that subject goes beyond the community. WEU and NATO. I mean, these are the kind of ideas which we'll be putting forward. So there will be in the IGC, quite properly, um, various uh, thrusts, various uh, uh, kinds of ideas being put forward by uh, member states, and out of that will come, I would think, I would think, but it's only a guess because the thing hasn't begun yet, a, 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 an, an agreement on, a, on, on steps forward. But there will be steps for the better working of the existing institutions. It seems to me that the, government, the British government uh, prefers an evolutionary approach to these matters. Uh, you will be aware of the WISE report produced recently by the House of Lords Select Committee on the European Communities. 
Uh, and in paragraph 20 of that report, um, the committee offered this observation, that the essential question is not whether a suggested transfer of power to or from a community institution will be another step on the road to or away from federalism, but whether it is likely to produce gains in the form of increased efficiency without loss of democratic accountability, or if both are likely to be produced, where the balance lies. Would that be a fair summary of the government's view of these matters? Yeah, that's right. It's very good. I thought that report went a little bit astray on matters of currency. But on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the political side, uh, it, was, it was admirable. And uh, thank you, Mr. Foreman, for reminding me of that quotation. This is just, just right. Uh, yeah, Mr. Foreman, one more. And, and on a related point, uh, and uh, bearing in mind that uh, people are obviously lobbying you from different directions on this matter, um, you will be aware of the Commission's opinion on political union, which was offered um, earlier in the year. And uh, they seem to have slightly more ambitious concept uh, of the role of the Intergovernmental Conference on Political Union, when they said it would provide a golden opportunity, A, to broaden the community's powers, and B, to improve its decision-making. Do you take the view, Foreign Secretary, that the latter is actually more important than the former? Yes, I do. I do. I think, you see, we're at the beginning of this conference, and everybody's setting out their, their wares, their store. Uh, that's perfectly right. But the key to, to the success of the conference, so far as we're concerned, is that our partners should understand two things. First of all, that our policy is what we say it is, that it didn't depend upon the identity of the Prime Minister, uh, and, and that the policy... Uh, remains a policy of evolving, to use the word that the last that Mrs. Thatcher used in her last major speech on Europe at the Mansion House. Um, that we believe in an evolving community, not an inexorable glacier. Uh, and secondly, that we want to make a success of this conference. We want to make a success of our membership of the community. We're not going to sit there as wreckers. We're not we're going to bring ideas of our own. Now if those two things are as I think they are, actually, um, then, then the chances of success at this conference are very substantial. And it, it, th those, that's the double message that in the next few weeks, as the conference gets underway, we have, to, we have to bring forward. Our policy is as stated, and it's not going to undergo a revolution because of a change of prime minister. That's the first point. Secondly, we want to have this IGC, both IGCs, but we're talking at the moment about the political union. We want it to succeed. We want the community to work better. We want it to take its decisions more effectively. Uh, and, and we want to reach agreement on that. Those, that's the double message with which we start. The Jim the, the, Jim the only point I wanted to make, supporting what my colleague has said about paragraph 20, is federalism is another word like European Union, which means lots of different things to different people. And in this country, some of my colleagues confuse federalism with centralism. And that's a wholly different no, no. question. Uh, Could I, I take it now that Her Majesty's Government would not accept federal government in Europe, even in the long run? Well, I, I, yes, you can take it that we shall not accept it as a, 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 a goal defined even in the long run. I mean, what our children will do, I don't know. But certainly, if we were asked to put our hands next year uh, to a document which contained provisions for the, the introduction of federal government. But I agree with what Mr. Lester said about that. But the introduction in the year 2000 and something of a system by which uh, Westminster was reduced to the levels of the Oxfordshire County Council, we would refuse. Sure. After that heartening reply, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not amazing. <laughs> Could I just explore the difference between the two IGCs? Uh, when discussing political union, the IGC on political union, you did make the point in a very careful way that in the end, any change in the treaties uh, would, of course, require unanimity, and that applied to uh, uh, any proposals for political union. But when you, you contrasted that with proposals for the other IGC to establish economic and monetary union, in which you seem to be saying there that, well, it's more difficult because they could always go off and make another separate treaty, the 11th. 
What is the distinction in law, in terms of the treaty, between political union and economic and monetary union? Why couldn't it be equally said, well, if we ran into serious difficulties on a political union and the 11 really wanted to go ahead towards this uh, quasi-federal objective, if they really wanted to do that, couldn't they sign a separate treaty in order to bring that about, just as they could with the EMU? That, that's a question. I don't think they will in the case of the EMU, um, partly because it would be technically very yeah, difficult to draft a separate treaty, and partly because it was quite clear to me from the Rome summit, I'm not sure if I've appeared before the committee since then, but since the first Rome summit in October, it was perfectly clear to me that they were above all anxious to bring us along uh, there was no appetite for proceeding without it. So I don't think that will in fact happen. But it's even theoretically not possible in the case of the political union, IGC, because there you're dealing with the existing institutions of which we're part. Uh, you're, you're dealing with the Commission, you're dealing with the Parliament, you're dealing with the Council of Ministers, you're dealing with the Court of Justice. These are all institutions at the heart of which we sit. So it's simply not not even theoretically a possibility. Well, I thank to, you, to to Mr. Board Secretary, again, for a very encouraging reply. Uh, Mr. Rowlands, <laughs> then we want to move on, I think. May I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> may I just ask you, at, at, last, at the last Rome meeting in the EMU, we were isolated. Um, do you feel that because of the complexity of the issues on political union and the differences of attitudes you describe, that we won't have a repeat performance on the IGC on political union that we've had on the EMU, and that we won't find ourselves, uh, as it will appearing to be just isolationist on these issues? Well, I, I hope not. It's, it's only a hope at the present moment. Uh, I hope not, because the document which we considered yesterday, two documents we considered yesterday, <laughs> were first of all a careful and uh, accurate summary of the work of the special representatives, that's the raw material of the IGC, and secondly, a, an account, an assessment by the presidency, by the Italian presidency, of that work. And uh, that assessment was, a, 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 in my view, a genuine attempt to summarize where opinions lay, what the areas which the IGC uh, could best uh, cover. And um, although I wouldn't have uh, phrased that assessment exactly as the Italians did, nevertheless, I thought it was a genuine attempt to make a fair assessment of where we stood. If those are the documents with which the IGC starts and with which the, on which the summit uh, uh, does its work, um, uh, then we won't. No, there won't be a, a, a commotion and there won't be a, a, a sort of rush to isolate us. If other ideas prevail in the next few days, then it's be a different matter. But it would be a pity because there's no point. From anybody's standpoint, there's no point in starting an IGC um, with um, uh, a manoeuvre in isolating one of those whose uh, approval is essential if the IGC is to succeed. But you said that well, on the EMU, and yes, it turned out not to be. But that's, that's entirely true. That's why I'm choosing my words rather carefully. Um, <laughs> it's not entirely true. There's an element of truth in this moment. No, what happened in the, in the uh, Rome summit is that the, it was decided, at the, rather at the last minute, that an attempt should be made to fix a date for the entry into force of stage two before stage two had been uh, discussed. And uh, Mrs. Thatcher uh, decided entirely rightly that this was not, not sensible. Others swallowed their doubts uh, because uh, they were swept along. Um, that was not a good idea. Now, could we turn the focus a little towards uh, talk of common foreign policy and common security policy, which is also swirling through the conclusions of previous European councils and was very much aired again at the uh, parliamentary conference in Rome already referred to. Um, Jim Lester. Yes, Foreign Secretary, I think you know at the Rome summit the uh, presidency conclusion said that no aspect of the Union's external relations will in principle be excluded from the common foreign policy. What I'd like to ask you is, does Her Majesty's Government accept the implications of this? Uh, for instance, would certain policy or geographical areas be selected for special treatment? Would consensus voting remain? How might commercial policy uh, and the Commission be incorporated in the framework? 
would countries still keep the right to opt out? I think the work has been refined a bit since the Rome summit. Um, I think there's quite a general view the practice the 12 will not become a defence community. That's a very important point. I say a general view because there are some who believe that it should. But I don't think that view is likely to prevail or that we will be isolated in saying that in practice the 12 by their membership um, present and future uh, are not likely to become a defence community and that the 11 of the 12 who rely for their defence on their membership of NATO will continue to do so. Now that's an important point. Um, I believe that in the areas of foreign policy and security policy, there is scope for further coordination of the views of the 12. And uh, I believe the consensus will remain. It's one of your questions. Um, but I believe there is scope for refining this and scope for establishing closer links uh, between the community, between the 12, and the uh, other institutions in this field, and I already mentioned them, I think the WEU and uh, NATO. So I think there's work to be done, constructive work to be done here. Lawrence? Um, do you intend that um, Europe should be given a formal role in foreign policy? You said that you didn't think that uh, there would be any such agreement on defence, but what about foreign policy, a formal role? Well, it has one in the single European Act, right? That was the first occasion on which, I think I'm right to say, uh, the treaty recognised that there was a foreign policy dimension of the uh, life of the Twelve. So that, uh, that exists and uh, will, I think, be further developed. It developed. It's not unspotted. It's not unblemished. It doesn't work perfectly but it is now part of all of our uh, way of life that we do seek, for example, on the Gulf, which we've already discussed. We do seek to find a consensus, not majority voting, a consensus to which we then hew. The um, Independent of today has an interesting slant on this, which I would like to put to you. It says, it, this is an article from David Osborne in Brussels. In a first sign of a softening in the government's line on Europe since John Major became Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary Douglas Heard signalled yesterday that Britain may support giving the European community a formal role in foreign policy and security. That's the first point. The change of tack was made at a meeting of foreign ministers in Brussels, where in return a guarantee was offered that no attempt would be made at the Heads of Government Summit in Rome next week to isolate Mr Major on any aspect of the proposals for political union in the way that Margaret Thatcher was isolated in October over the single currency. Was some such agreement made? No, there was no such agreement. There was uh, a discussion I've already summarised about the papers which should go forward to the Rome summit. And um, I expressed the view that uh, it would be a mistake to um, uh, repeat the tactic uh, which was used in the other case at the first Rome summit. I've already expressed this view privately, I think, to almost all the foreign ministers. Obviously, I've been in very close touch with them. Um, and, and I expressed the view in the council uh, uh, yesterday. And uh, I've already described the way in which the Italian presidency told us they intended to proceed. And I was uh, reassured by that, with the caveat that these things do change the last days uh, before a council, so I'm not, uh, you know, one cannot be wholly certain how it be handled, but I was reassured by the way in which they proposed to do it. I, there was no softening on that on, uh, policy on our part. Uh, indeed, there was perhaps rather, I would describe it as a strengthening of policy, because I did say, as I've already said to the committee, that I, I did believe that from the British point of view, there was scope for further uh, definition clarity and effectiveness in the way in which the 12 
organise these discussions on foreign and security policy, and that I did hope to have ideas to put forward uh, on this front as the IGC proceeded. I did say that, and uh, uh, because I think it's in our interest that that should be so. Does that clarification mean some form of legal competence, not just formal participation, but legal competence, some structure by which the decisions of the um, Council of Ministers on foreign affairs can be made law in the community? No, the, the Single European Act, I haven't... Uh, the tapes there. Title 3 deals with treaty provisions. Um, perhaps I could read that. This is Article 30 of the Single European Act. The high contracting parties shall endeavour jointly to formulate and implement a European foreign policy. Uh, they undertake to conform and consult each other on any foreign policy matters of general interest. Uh, such consultations shall take place before the high contracting parties decide on their final position, etc. I mean, I would refer the committee to the whole of Article 30, which is rather too long to read, but it does clearly provide a statutory basis uh, for European cooperation in the sphere of foreign policy. Could we uh, Mr. Lester? Clear up what an extension of the definition of security policy means, and could you relate that to the CSCE and how that fits into the overall framework of organisation in this constantly moving scene? Yes. The, the, um, the community has learned pragmatically the usefulness of this distinction between security policy and defense policy. Defense policy is the means of collective defense. Uh, mutual guarantees, stationing of forces, uh, deployment of weapons, nature of command. Now, those, I don't think, are ever going to be matters for the 12. For 11 of the 12, they're matters for, for NATO. NATO has, is rejuvenating itself. Very important. And that, I think, uh, that is the essence of defense. Now, there are other matters, like arms control, like national controls on the exports of uh, nuclear, chemical, missile materials, like peacekeeping issues, where, for example, there's a, uh, a UN peacekeeping effort, or where, as in the Gulf, there's a need to coordinate uh, forces, uh, where these are security issues, and the IGC will want to consider um, the way in which they are discussed uh, among the 12. These seem to be the kind of issues which could and should be discussed among the 12. And, uh, but this is an area which the IGC, I think, will, will, will want to work on. Clearly we want to work on. Everybody wants to, it, to work on that and to reach some conclusion on it. Um, the other question I wanted to ask you is, he sees foreign policy identity and its relations to other major powers, such as the United States and Canada. How do they fit into the EPC structure? I know the EPC's recently signed declarations with both, but... Uh, we have, that's right. This was an American initiative, uh, and uh, I was very anxious that the Canadians should not be... Uh, you know, should, should be brought along also, which they were keen to have. I was anxious they should not be forgotten in this. Um, and two declarations have now been concluded between the community, between the 12 and the United States and Canada, which provide for work in this field. It will in practice be work among officials first, um, with periodical ministerial meetings. That's to say James Blake, the Secretary of State, Joe Clark, the Canadian Secretary of State, will have periodical meetings with the foreign ministers of the 12, in which they will discuss, we will all discuss, the kind of things which we do discuss uh, when the 12 meet to discuss, to talk about uh, foreign policy. And that's an important, in my view, an important step forward. Could I just take you back to my previous question and relate the CSCE uh, conclusions in Paris to the overall security discussions within the community itself? Well, the CSGA um, summit in Paris was prepared both in the 12 as a security matter and in NATO. 
is an interesting example of preparations going along in parallel in the same city uh, within the two uh, organizations. And occasionally that produces overlap and untidiness, but it, but it actually worked. And the CSC summit in Paris was very well prepared. Um, the, the actual conclusions of it had been worked out very successfully, when you consider we're talking about 34 countries, very successfully, and that owed a good deal to the preparation on the Western side. So, I mean, that, and, and I think now the follow through of Paris, the, the, the next steps that lead up to um, Helsinki 1992, uh, the, the preparation will go, on in the, will go on in that way also. Um, Foreign Secretary, you mentioned earlier subsidiarity, which is supposed to govern and settle which powers and functions are carried through by the community at community level and which at national level. I think we'd now like to pursue this aspect in more detail. I'll ask Mr. Shaw to have some questions to Thank you. Foreign Secretary, I think in your evidence to the House of Lords uh, uh, Select Committee, um, you volunteered um, a rather sort of sympathetic view of uh, the prospects of writing a de definition of subsidiarity into the treaties. Um, surely, however, this would depend, would it not, upon <laughs> the definition itself, which is an extremely difficult one. The heart of the question is what is what should be considered to be subsidiary and what should not. Uh, and wouldn't any attempt to write in a definition uh, then have to accept the fact that it's going to be interpreted at the discretion of the uh, European Court. Wouldn't these be enormous obstacles, frankly, to trying to use the principle of subsidiarity uh, to establish any serious uh, doctrine um, for establishing what is appropriate to decision at the community level and what should be left at the national level? It's certainly not easy or straightforward. I think Mr. Shaw is right about that. I think regard this as a classic example of something that you can't really tackle until you tackle it, that you can't actually, until you've actually got round a table intensively, the towel around your head for hour after hour, you can't decide whether it is going to be worthwhile. I think uh, there are various ideas going on the rounds of this. Undoubtedly, you, you picked up there's an idea that it should be in some preamble, that it should be an objective rather than a definition, uh, in, uh, in, as it were, definitive in executive form. Um, subsidiarity means the community shouldn't act uh, at all unless such action by the community is necessary. It means that where it does act, it shouldn't overact, it shouldn't overregulate. Uh, and so it means preventing the unnecessary extension of community competence and activity in areas which should remain primarily the responsibility of national governments. Now, if you're going to put it into the treaty, there needs to be a clear definition of that, and then you consider, have to consider how that definition is going to be applied in particular cases, is the point you're on. Um, one possibility would be, as you say, to leave it to the court, like any other interpretation of the treaty, Another, another way would be to have a specific way of dealing with this, which wasn't specific to the court, which didn't therefore involve all that delay. Um, but that is, these are precisely the points which uh, the IGC will want to consider before it decides whether subsidiarity is going to find a place in uh, treaty amendment. Do you know what uh, approach to this question is likely to be made by uh, fellow members of the community? I don't. I don't. I'm not certain about that. Uh, President de Law is, of course, keen on subsidiarity, but what I'm not sure about is how... I, I'm not sure you would approach it from exactly the same angle as I just have. But this is where we need the towels around the head. Do you think it should be judicial? Well, they've got to have some way of interpreting it, yes. So I think you would have to have some way, but it wouldn't necessarily need to be the, the normal way of the European Court. Dr. Corbyn? On this point, one second, isn't it likely that the way it will work is that the political decision will be taken by the European Council initially whether or not it's appropriate and necessary uh, to um, conduct a certain policy at the supranational level. And once that has been taken, is it not likely that uh, any conflict of competence thereafter uh, will be for the European Court to, uh, in, uh, to adjudicate upon? Yes. I mean, 
that may be so. That is one pattern. Other patterns are, uh, are possible. Um, I really think that this is a matter I mean, the committee may wish to return to, because I, the, the discussion of this hasn't really advanced very much since we last discussed it. It's still a discussion in rather general terms. Um, the two questions are, can you define this usefully in a treaty amendment? And secondly, how would you in practice interpret it uh, um, case by case? And the, the discussion of those two points is, is not yet far advanced, but will need to be. Um, Mr. Lawrence, so Mr. Welsh. <laughs> Um, it all depends, of course, what you mean by a subsidiarity. And when this committee went round the capitals of uh, the European community last and we asked everybody what they meant, they all had different answers and some didn't know how to answer. Now, if, if by subsidiarity you mean that in any issue where the implications transcend member state frontiers or in any case where the decisions are more likely to be carried out more effectively by the Union than by the member states, if that's what you mean by subsidiarity, then are we not into a worrying situation as far as national sovereign parliaments are concerned for this reason? That the Commission may say in any case, this problem transcends the interests of a member state and or we can carry it out more effectively from a union basis than by a national basis, and therefore say that this is a matter which shall be dealt with by the European community and not by the nation, national parliament, the court ruling on it may well come to the same agreement when a precedent will be established and thereafter there will be no going back. Now, it doesn't seem to me to be of the essence of the matter whether a court decides the issue. The essence of the matter depends upon how you define subsidiarity. And you can define it in a way which is totally, totally um, un, um, unsupportive of the national parliamentary um, concept. You, you could indeed. I, I, of course you could. Uh, that's why definition is so important. Uh, but obviously we, we would not accept such a definition. That's very encouraging. I mean, subsidiarity means, I repeat, the community shouldn't act at all unless such action is necessary. And where it does act, it should not act, it should not overact, it should not overregulate. There are many, many matters which transcend national frontiers, where nevertheless it's sensible for nation states to, to have the basic responsibility. And, uh, and so I don't think that the criteria is, uh, is the right one. Nor among all the suggestions I've heard, have I heard it suggested that the Commission alone should decide uh, uh, how, this, uh, how this would apply. I don't think that would be acceptable to many member states. So this is, a, this is an idea which could be useful. It could be useful. It's a more sophisticated idea than that, simply the idea of legal competence. It's a question. It, it, but it's an idea which, if it's to be useful, has got to be very carefully defined, as Mr. Lawrence uh, makes his point. Uh, and also, you have to decide who is, apart from the general definition in a treaty, uh, wh how it's actually going to be applied and tackled uh, case by case. That's the work ahead. And would it be retrospective? I don't think I see how it could be retrospective. Mr. Welsh? Uh, Mr. Welsh, actually, doesn't it mean everything to all men? And shouldn't the word be taken away and something else used? Why should we use a word from the old German uh, Catholicism? Well, because it, it embodies a useful idea. What we don't know yet is whether it can be pinned down, pinned down in lawyers' language, which will be useful. Now, that we don't know. But it's worth the attempt because everybody is conscious that you do need to have a test. You do need to have a test of where the community should, uh, should act and where it should leave things to others. Sure. Have you any more questions on this aspect before we move on to democratic uh, structures. Well, I wanted to deal with the, uh, the question of the extension of, of community competence. Uh, I mean, this is a long-term thrust of the European institutions to extend the competence uh, of the communities and, of course, to enlarge the treaties to do that. Um, 
are we not going to be faced with a very substantial uh, uh, pressure to extend qualified majority voting uh, beyond the existing areas where it applies across the face of the treaty, maybe with a few exceptions? Isn't this, in fact, the, the main danger that we face at this uh, political union conference? Well, there will be two sets, well, there will be several sets of pressures, but two of them will be to extend competence, i.e. to authorise the community to act as a community in areas like health, where it doesn't act now, and to extend qualified majority voting in areas which are within competence but have the unanimity rule. Yeah. We'll have both. As I say, we don't believe in a glass We don't believe it is inevitable or inexorable that there should be changes down either route. We are prepared to consider in the IGC arguments, but we don't believe that the case for either kind of movement has been met. As I say, we don't see at the moment arguments for uh, extending uh, qualified majority QMV, uh, qualified majority voting, or for extending competence. I think it would be silly to say to say never. We've not said never, uh, but we are not. We don't at the moment see the arguments for movement down either of those particular uh, routes. Does that apply in, in this particular case of the, uh, the social charter? Would you not wish to see there qualified majority voting? The social charter is, uh, is a very interesting case. There was a great brouhaha when Mrs. Thatcher alone opposed the social charter. It therefore went into a sort of limbo, a, a document which 11 members uh, were in favor of. When it actually came to the action, uh, a whole series of uh, proposals have been put forward under the general mm. umbrella by Madame Papadreau, or by the commission. On the instance of Madame Papadreau, the relevant commissioner, they're not making very good headway. Mm. It's not because Britain opposed the social charter. It's because when you actually get down to the practice, a lot of it doesn't make a great deal of sense to member states. Now, I'm thinking about some of these are unanimity and some of these are qualified for trying to vote. So, yes. That's social right. Social action, correct. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, they, they, they come under different constitutional headings. Uh, I think an error has been made in producing some of the most, most difficult things first. Because there are some of these matters, some of these actual proposals which we would uh, have no difficulty with. But as I say, it's not just a matter of us. It, it is a matter of when it comes to the practicalities the phraseology of the social charter has not proved to be an, an adequate guide to action. Social charter, fire and safety, I think you will agree, is an enormous uh, uh, whole or term for a vast range of, of possible actions. But I notice in the commission document their opinion on political uh, union. Uh, they actually refer under social affairs to extending competence to basic and further vocational training and indeed outside of, if you like, health and safety at work, um, to programs to prevent and combat major threats to health, such as cancer and AIDS. I mean, is it seriously suggested that we should hand over half of our health service uh, uh, policies uh, to uh, European institutions? Not by us. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, any more questions on this aspect? Because I want, do want to move on. <laughs> Right, Mr. Foreman, now we must move on. It's just a supplementary to that, Foreman Secretary. I remember the British government used to say not so long ago that uh, it was fairly relaxed about qualified majority voting, especially in the context of progress towards the completed single market, because it was very often in the national interest, apart from the community interest, that that should be so. But I remember that we put down some specific reservations on matters to do with migration, uh, labour law and taxation. Is that still the government's position, or has that uh, been modified in any way by recent events? No, I think that is right. We are. In, we believe that qualified majority voting has worked well in the single market, and that the uh, effort to reducing protections in the community would have been much slower, a faultier, if everything had to be done by unanimity. This is a case where qualified majority voting has worked on the whole well, on the whole, we would say, in British interests there's a natural alliance on many of these matters between ourselves and the Commission. 
um, and some of the, and the less protectionist member states. But uh, we do not, I repeat, we do not believe that there has been established at the present time a case for uh, further extension. We will listen to the arguments, but that's our position at the moment. Now could we come on to this whole question of so-called democratic legitimacy, uh, the possible expansion of the powers of the European Parliament and the balance of institutions within the community? Mr Lawrence. Well, one necessary prerequisite of uh, a federal union of democratic states would inevitably be, would it not, uh, Foreign Secretary, the expansion of the powers of a European Parliament. So the question is, what more power should the European Parliament have, if any? Uh, in Rome in October, the United Kingdom government entered a reservation against the development of the European Parliament's role in the legislative sphere. So what I want to ask is whether that means that you rule out the extension of the European Parliament's rule only in relation to legislation, or whether you would rule it out in other spheres, such as an extension of its role in relation to the budget, or the monitoring of the Commission's work, or any other comment about the role, the, uh, uh, an extended role, or otherwise, of the European Parliament? We don't favour uh, an extension, further extension, of the legislative of the European Parliament. Um, it has a say in legislation now. It was given in the Single European Act a somewhat greater say. And uh, we do not see a case for extending that, uh, those legislative powers. What we would like to do is not to diminish the European Parliament, but to divert its energies into a field where Euro national parliaments are really not able to operate successfully which is important, and which in the case of other parliaments has given those parliaments their real vigour and traditional strength, certainly this parliament, namely the monitoring of the work of the executive, in this case the Commission. And therefore we do believe in strengthening the European Parliament's role in ensuring financial accountability. Uh, we believe in strengthening the European Parliament's Budgetary Control Committee. Um, uh, we believe that it should operate more like our own Public Accounts Committee. Um, we believe that there should be a greater role of the European Parliament in supervising the Commission, and that there should be a greater European Parliament interest in implementation, um, for example, chasing the Commission to chase member states who don't uh, carry out their obligations. Um, now, there are other interesting ideas that there might community ombudsman, not dealing obviously with matters within the jurisdiction of member states, but dealing with matters which are within community competence, etc. So there are ideas in this field, um, but they're not in the sphere of increasing the legislative powers of the European Parliament, but rather of diverting their energies into areas which national parliaments, where they don't compete with national parliaments, because national parliaments are not capable of acting, but where action is needed. That's the basic approach to this. Would you wish to see the European Parliament appoint or approve the appointment of the President or the members of the Commission? No. Could I ask a, a short question? You know that you, the European Parliament at present has powers to increase the budget. So it is one of the few parliaments which has the power to increase the budget, first of all, and secondly, of course, it doesn't have the obligations or responsibility of raising the money to meet any of the uh, expenditure of the committee, Commission. So don't you think there should be a reduction in the European Parliament's uh, powers, namely that it cannot increase expenditure? Well, I think clawing back powers already given, that's going to be uphill there. That. <laughs> that will need you <laughs> <laughs> the other way. I'm not sure that's, I mean, it's logical, as to well. I'm not entirely sure it's practical. <laughs> Mr. Lawrence, have another question? Well, just as far as decisions to the future of the European Parliament are, are decisions which would be taken um, by majority decision or by, con or, or by consensus? No, any, 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 these are matters which are in the treaty. Any changes to the treaty need unanimity. 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Shaw. Yeah. Um, on the uh, Council of Ministers and its role, I think that uh, Council of Ministers has certainly been the major decision-making body in the community, and I assume that it will continue uh, to be so. Um, but if we are going to argue for greater accountability, isn't there really a case for trying to open up the decision-making of the Council of Ministers by publishing in advance agendas and other ways so that there can be sensible discussions in national parliaments before really quite important matters are decided? I've covered this ground before, Mr. Shaw. I mean, the Council of Ministers has two of these two characteristics, doesn't it? It is a, it is a negotiating body. Um, and the fact is you will not get success in these negotiations if every step is signalled in advance. You just won't. It's also a legislative body, I mean, as you, as you, yeah. as you rightly said. Mm -hmm. um, and national parliaments in making their arrangements have to take that into account. I mean, today, tomorrow's debate is a case in point. It's changed its nature. It's no longer a very empty, ill-attended debate on a white paper summarising events in the community over a period of six months, ten or eleven months away because the Foreign Office was slow in getting the paper together. It no longer is that. It will yeah. be a debate, I suspect, previewing the European Council yeah. in ten days' time. That's because the House of Commons has alerted itself and yeah. will make a better use of the time available to it for EC matters. That is a good thing. I think the government had something to do with that change. I think that's a good thing. Uh, that's an example of a, of a, yeah. of a, a national parliament asserting itself and, and trying to influence a discussion before it takes place. And I've been open, as open as I can be today, about the agenda yeah. in Rome in ten years' time, in order to, to, so that uh, discussion can be guided. And I will be influenced, obviously, and the Prime Minister will be influenced by what the House of Commons says tomorrow. I mean, I think this has moved in the direction you want. Yes. I, I certainly accept that, and I'm sure we're all very pleased to have a prospective uh, debate, as it were, on EC events rather than a retrospective one. Um, could I, however, follow up this uh, really very important point that those of us who take part in these debates will obviously be seeking to influence ministers uh, in the line that they take at the forthcoming councils. But isn't our influence here absolutely sort of crucially dependent upon decisions being taken uh, unanimously uh, in the Council of Ministers? And isn't it a major problem for us that wherever decisions are taken by qualified majority votes, we can have no real uh, assurance that our own views are going to have any influence at all on the decisions that are taken? Well, your own views will have influence on the ministers whom you send how those ministers then get on will vary, and, and it doesn't only depend on whether it's unanimity or qualified majority voting. Um, you can, uh, so you will have an influence. It won't be a total influence. No, that's the nature of a community. But it, you will have an influence, however the matter is decided, I would say. But doesn't this uh, development of qualified majority voting, which I hope will always be restricted to as uh, narrowly as possible, doesn't it in fact uh, give the case to the uh, advocates of uh, greater powers for the European Parliament, because they say to us, in a sense quite rightly, you can't control the thing when it, it's decided by majority voting. Only we can come in and, and, uh, and uh, use our uh, institutional procedures for approving and amending. And aren't we really getting into a trap here where constantly we are being pressed uh, to transfer uh, responsibilities and to improve increase the competence of the communities. Uh, and wherever that happens, or qualified majority voting is instituted, you then get the European Parliament sort of shouting about its democratic deficit, simply because it has already taken away from the democratic national parliaments uh, the rights that previously belonged to it. Well, I, I see the logic of that. I wouldn't accept that as an argument against uh, qualified majority voting, um, but I've already coloured our attitude on that. I think that the national parliaments should continue to be alert for ways in which they can increase their influence. I mean, I would like to, this isn't really a matter for governments. 
I'd hoped that your size would, would, would come forward with something in this field. And this is a case for national parliaments clubbing together to a greater extent than they do now. Um, and and uh, considering how to deal with precisely this kind of point, um, because after all, national parliaments are, uh, are just as, um, you know, just, just as, as, as democratically legitimate as the European Parliament in dealing with European matters. I, I would like to see a greater coming together of the, of the uh, uh, national parliaments. One, one of the ideas uh, aired at the Assize, uh, Foreign Secretary, was of course that it should uh, meet regularly. Indeed, I think something to that effect appears in the final yeah. draft. Um, what um, what do you say to that? Well, I'd be in fact, I mean, you're better qualified to judge because you were there, Mr. Chairman, so I, I don't know what your appetite for that would be. But, uh, but I mean, in, in principle, I would be in favour of that. In principle, I would be in favour of that. Mr. Foreman. Thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to go back a little bit, Foreign Secretary, to what you said earlier in answer to Mr. Shaw. I mean, would you not accept that it is the case that it's perfectly possible in any political system to have considerable influence without necessarily being in the majority, qualified or otherwise? And indeed, our whole political system is evidence of that. I agree, I agree with that. I think Mr. Shaw is, if I say so, being a little too legalistic about it. What the uh, House of Commons will be doing tomorrow is not actually binding the Prime Minister or myself but exercising influence on us and promising us a bad quarter of an hour if we come back and totally ignored the thrust of the debate. And that will be, that kind of political influence will be valid, uh, whether it's uh, unanimity or qualified majority vote. And secondly, if I may, Jim, uh, is there not some difficulty, Foreign Secretary, in your understandable wish to get the European Parliament to emulate the Public Accounts Committee more precisely and to monitor and control the European executive in the form of the Commission, when in fact history teaches us that uh, traditionally the Commission and the Parliament have seen, themse seen themselves as institutional allies in the development of European integration as against national parliaments and the Council of Ministers. But they should be allies in good government, you see what I mean. And part of good government in an imperfect world is that you are, do look very carefully at what in this case, the Commission does, and how the money is spent. Mm -hmm. Think of the sums available under a common agricultural policy, regardless of its merits. These are very large sums of money. And uh, there are other programs of the same kind. They really do require rigor. Even if you're 100% in favor of the program, even particularly if you're 100% in favor of the program, uh, you need a, a rigorous system of making sure that money goes to the people who need it and for whom it's intended. Now, there is a system, I'm not saying there's no system, but we believe the energy of the European Parliament could, should be concentrated on improving that system and asserting a role for itself while it's doing it. And that's, doesn't, uh, you know, that's uh, in its own self-interest it should do that. It can do that while being 100% of in favor of doubling each program, 100%. We're not dealing with that. We're dealing with the efficiency, with the actual rigor with which the resources are used. Mr. Rowlands, then we must move on. Uh, when we, uh, this committee traveled earlier and to prepare a report on the operation of the single act, the one thing that struck me, and indeed I think we put it into our report, was that we found in all the capitals we went to that we were almost unique in defining our sovereignty in terms of national parliamentary institutions that the Spaniards and the French and the Italians and the Germans even didn't see sovereignty in terms of national parliamentary institutional powers. And that in fact there was a great willingness to forsake a lot of national parliamentary power to, a, to establish or to bridge the European, the European parliamentary deficit, the democratic deficit. I noticed only last week Chancellor Kohl actually advocated a reduction in national parliamentary sovereignty in favour of greater European parliamentary sovereignty. On the range of issues we've just been discussing, Foreign Secretary, don't you think that this is a case where we could have found ourselves, perfectly legitimately, I may say, in almost splendid isolation because I of our definition of sovereignty in this particular way? I think well, your, your first point is right. I think we do uh, think more clearly and strongly in terms of national parliamentary sovereignty than probably any other member state. Uh, the Danes, of course, have a system which puts a big accent on their faculty. The French have a system which put a big accent on the national sovereign government rather mm. than parliament. Mm. Uh, that's their historical 
accent. Um, but you're perfectly right about Chancellor Cole. I think you'd be perfectly willing to do that. I think he said that uh, many times. So I think this is a, an area uh, where we have a, a idiosyncratic uh, position. But I mean, I think it's a, a just position. I don't think you'd let us stray too far away from it. Any House of Commons. So there we are. I, but I repeat, you know, the progress on this is going to be progress which everybody accepts. I have to report to this Committee of Foreign Secretary that while some was in Rome last week, 120 Italian MPs voted in favour of the proposition they'd rather be ruled from Brussels than from Rome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, could we now just briefly turn to um, Monetary Union? You, you rightly you advised us that this won't be a major subject at the European Council, although obviously it is the subject at one of the IGCs that follows it. But just one question on this. Um, there are those who offer the view that a single money, a single currency, really means a federal state. It means a single monetary policy and therefore a federal state. What, what do you say to that? I think that uh, if it were imposed as a result of political decisions, uh, that would be the consequence. Um, I think that if it, it evolved over a period of time, um, as a result of the choice of individual citizens, um, then the two things could be reconciled. I think that's probably the right answer. Mm. Well, I think we, we won't pursue that, not because it isn't a central issue, and I realise it'll be central in your mind, but it is obviously a matter where the Chancellor will lead, and um, it is, uh, as you said, not a main, going to be a main subject at the Council. So could we then now turn on to the... Eastern European and Soviet dimensions. Uh, and Mr. Rowland. Right along with the beginning of your evidence, you said that a change of Prime Minister wasn't necessarily a change of policy. Uh, and Mrs. Thatcher, in her last speech in the House of Prime Minister, said this, we have worked for our vision of a Europe which is free and open to the rest of the world, and above all, to the countries of Eastern Europe. It would not help them if Europe became a tight-knit little club. Now, I think we all knew what she was saying. She was arguing that you couldn't, that a greater political and economic union of the 12 would create a greater difficulties in bridging the, in bridging the gap and the gulf between Eastern European, East, Eastern European countries and, and the EC. First of all, do you see a, a genuine conflict of prior, not only of priorities but of principle and vision in this respect? No, I don't think there's a conflict. I think that as we proceed with both IGCs, we need to take into account the probability, welcome probability, so far as the British government is concerned, that by the end of the decade there will be more than 12 members. You've got two sets of possible applicants. Um, we've got three actual applicants, four actual applicants. Uh, you've got two sets of possible further applicants that some of the member states have after, and some of the newly democratic members of, the, of, the, of Central and Eastern Europe, not members, countries. Central and Eastern Europe. And uh, so we are going to be faced, but not until 93, with the prospect of negotiations for uh, fresh membership. We welcome that. And of course, it does influence, should influence both IGCs. I don't say there's a conflict, but the, it should, you, the, 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 that possibility has to be in the back of our mind. It should influence them in what? In proceeding more slowly on political and economic no, not, necess not necessarily. I mean, it, you, you produce, I've heard arguments produced the other way. Obviously, if we've got a bigger community, the argument for qualified majority uh, voting for purely mechanical reasons is stronger. So you can use the argument either way. Um, but uh, that should be a factor as the two IGCs get to work. In your, in, in your mind, which are the stronger of the two arguments? I think that the, uh, as far as the email is concerned, I think that the prospect of fresh members should uh, give pause to... Uh, rush into the kind of stage three envisaged in the Delors plan. Um, do you see the opening of negotiation on association agreements with Poland, Hungary and Czechoslovakia uh, to be a step towards the EC membership? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I must do the, I mean, these association agreements, we were the first people to propose them. And I hope that it won't be very long. I hope that the agreement on the mandates for the Commission to negotiate them will be completed next week, this month anyway. Negotiations, I hope, will begin in January 
with Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. And these association agreements for some time will be the main vehicle for the community's relationship with those three countries and with others as they come along. And that means liberalization <coughs> of trade so that free trade in industrial products is achieved, agriculture more difficult, and, but there will be liberalization. Over time, free movement of services, capital and goods should also be possible. This is all assuming that uh, the reforms continue in those countries. Political dialogue, a degree of financial help. Now, that's quite substantial. And I would certainly see these association agreements as a bridge to eventual EC membership. And uh, Article 237 of the treaty does provide, in effect, an invitation to European states to apply for membership when they're qualified. And um, I, would, uh, I think we should draw attention to that. I think this is a good, a good, uh, a good development. And as you say, the association agreements are a bridge, not a certainty, not a guarantee, because it is conditional, but a, a, a possible bridge to eventual full membership. And given your earlier answers, the, but immediate assistance is through the Group of 24 rather than through the EC itself? There is, of course, EC assistance. There has been, I think, to all the countries involved. There's indeed, there's UK, there's British assistance to all the countries involved through the know-how funds. Um, but I think for the kind of massive uh, extra financial help, which is a result of the oil crisis and the change in the Comic-Con arrangements, both those hitting these countries simultaneously this winter, um, I think that that's, that problem is one that's got to be solved more widely than the community. Is that yes. on the agenda? Yes, that's right. Yes. It's on the agenda of the it is, but we shall argue at the, <coughs> we shall argue as I did yesterday, that it has to in practice to be tackled on a wider campus. Is that distinct from the reports of the EC putting together a huge program of assistance, a vast program of assistance, including food aid for the Soviet Union, because I think Mr. Cannon wants to ask you on, on, on yeah, that. They're, they're quite separate backgrounds. Quite separate. Mr. Cannon, I'd like to pursue that. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, what decisions is the European Council likely to take on assistance to the Soviet Union, and how would any EC contribution be coordinated with the results of the IMF study? It's not yet certain, because the Commission has a great deal of work to do between now and next uh, Thursday. And... Uh, work which it's undertaking alongside the similar work of the IMF. <coughs> so I, I don't, my, it's, it's a, a not, I can't make a certain prediction, Mr. Khan. But I, what I think will happen is that the Commission will come forward with ideas about food. Um, and because I believe they will show that there are food shortages. There's certainly a, a considerable Soviet uh, desire to have the shelves of the shops filled. Um, we believe that the essential problem here is one of distribution. Uh, the harvest was not a bad one in terms of quantity. It is simply getting the food to the shops. It proves extraordinarily difficult, and more difficult than it was before. And uh, therefore, we believe that the help that's needed is essentially that of moving the food, distributing it. And we have the British uh, team uh, at work in, in around Kiev as a result of uh, the uh, British effort in Kiev earlier this summer, which the Prime Minister went to, uh, precisely in this field. And when we established the British Know How Fund for the Soviet Union three weeks ago, we put food distribution at the head of the projects which we think we can reasonably finance and help with. So I, I think that the immediate propositions before the European Council will be likely to be uh, some measure of food aid, but in what form, I don't know. There are problems about the, what appears to be the easy solution of, of moving our own surpluses straight into the Soviet Union. We've already had representations both from Hungary and New Zealand about their traditional uh, exports to the Soviet Union and how these would be uh, screwed up if we did this. So there are problems there, and I don't know what the Commission will propose. Then I think there will be a proposition about technical assistance on which we're all agreed and there'll be a problem about the size of it. Then the longer term, medium term, longer term, balance of payments help, the kind of things that the Soviet Union has been requesting. That, I think, has to await the IMF studies, which the Group of Seven uh, requested, authorized at the Houston summit in the summer. Uh, and I, I, would, 
I would be somewhat surprised, although there will be pressure in this direction, I'd be somewhat surprised if the European Council next week took decisions of a, a long-term kind, because I think it will need, they will need to study the IMF report. I'm sure I'll write Foreign Secretary about distribution in the longer term, but we are getting reports from Leningrad that German food parcels are very much appreciated here and now and in the coming weeks. Uh, are you sure we shouldn't also be putting as much emphasis as the Germans on actual short-term uh, prevention of starvation? Yeah. It may well be that the Commission will produce that they clearly are likely to produce ideas of that kind. The Germans are identifying particular institutions like creches, particular places, and then making sure the food actually gets to those places and not to anywhere else. There are problems. I mean, uh, President Delors was talking about them yesterday. The problems of, if you use, there is a sort of growing, nascent private sector, but it's extremely expensive because the, the cut, the, 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 the take which these uh, growing entrepreneurs uh, uh, expect to receive from these activities is, 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 is quite substantial. But these are the kind of things, you know, which, which the, which the, the, the Commission is working on, and I expect they will produce ideas for the immediate uh, transfer of food. But the distribution aspect of it is crucial. Yeah, Mr. Cameron. Yeah, I would like to uh, ask a question on the Gulf. Well, could, uh, could um, I just ask one more question yeah. from the Chair on the Soviet Union. A, a theme creeping into EC ministers' speeches increasingly is the worry that if all this goes wrong, as it's rapidly doing the Soviet Union, uh, Central and Western Europe will be threatened with enormous pressures of migration. Is that something you think will come <coughs> on the European Council agenda? I'd be surprised if it wasn't mentioned. I doubt if there will be a, a big discussion of it as a separate issue because the agenda is a crowded one. But it is on very much on people's minds. Um, and there are two views. There is a view that this is likely to happen on a large scale. There is another view that it's not. That Russians in particular don't, wouldn't be likely to behave in this way, that they've had practical difficulties about documents and that, they would, uh, that it wouldn't be particularly easy to do. But I mean, I'm, I'm simply reporting these two views. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Foreman, just on that, and then yeah. Ms. Carmel's work. Chairman, I'm grateful. On this point about uh, economic and other assistance uh, to the Soviet <coughs> Union, Foreign Secretary, and also to the other Central European countries that used to be in Comic Con, I think most members of this committee would probably agree that it appears that the needs of these countries, in varying degrees, are very great. And I think it might assist this committee if either today or perhaps subsequently in a note to the committee, you were able to put some figures, first of all, on y your official's professional assessment of the extent of the need of these various countries, both in aggregate and in individual cases. It can only be an estimate. And secondly, so that we may make an informed comparison, uh, the extent to which uh, we in this country and the community more widely has actually met those needs already. I mean, I'm not clear in my own mind uh, how much there has been in by way of grants, uh, credits, uh, help of one kind or another, and I think it would be helpful to know. We can certainly do that. I gladly do that. I mean, there has been a lot over the last two or three years. Emergency aid, food aid, technical assistance, stabilization funds, particularly for Poland and for Hungary. Uh, there's been a, a quite a massive Effort, but we will, we will let you have the particulars. Mr. Cameron, on yes, the Gulf. Uh, Secretary of State, I just wanted to ask you a question about the Gulf crisis. Uh, you mentioned earlier the common voice of the 12 in support of United Nations resolutions, and there has also been a general uh, welcome uh, for the forthcoming dialogue between Secretary of State Baker and uh, Saddam Hussein. However, the British government uh, have made it uh, perfectly clear that they do not wish to see that uh, dialogue developing into meaningful negotiations which might bring a, a peaceful settlement uh, to, the, to the crisis. I haven't detected any similar hardline statements from our uh, European partners, and I wonder if there might be some merit uh, in further uh, discussion on this point uh, when you meet them next week. Uh, bearing in mind the reports, albeit unconfirmed reports uh, earlier today, uh, that a deal might be struck whereby uh, Iraq would agree to withdraw from Kuwait in return for a new agreement uh, on the disputed oil field on the, the Iraq-Kuwait border. Would, would such an agreement not be 
preferable to a, a very, very destructive uh, conflict, which could mean many casualties. No, I mean, <coughs> we discussed this in some detail yesterday in the Council, in the, in the uh, Foreign Affairs Council. And we were all agreed, as we are on record, of saying, and as I hope we will say again next weekend, that uh, the only basis for peaceful solution is full implementation of the Security Council resolutions. Uh, there is no other basis. And um, that is the view of the community and will continue to be the view of the community. Mr Welsh, a final question on enlargement. Yes, sir. Foreign Secretary, uh, what are the main problem areas in the EC and EFTA negotiations? Um, the uh, problems are twofold uh, in these negotiations. Uh, the, on the one hand, the EFTA countries have a whole list of derogations. That's to say, matters on which they don't want to have to swallow the community aki, some of community decisions. On the other hand, the EFTA countries want a say of some kind. I'm not sure I'm using the terms of art in the negotiation, but they want a say of some kind in the way the community takes future decisions. Now, those are the two basic arguments in the current negotiations. Um, they've reached a critical stage. Now, there is an important meeting on the 19th of December ECF to ministerial meeting. And our hope, which I emphasised yesterday, will be that at that meeting um, there will be enough progress to make it clear that this negotiation is going to succeed. It is very important that they do succeed. Could I just ask very briefly then, if they, should they not succeed, but uh, the individual state request for EC membership, what would be Her Majesty's Government's view on that? One of them has, Austria already has, and there's a good deal of discussion in Sweden about the same. The community has agreed, and we accept support for this, that there shouldn't actually be negotiations for fresh, full membership before the end of 92. But after that, uh, we will have to proceed to, the, to deal with applications in an orderly way, and the Commission will have to give that view, and, and uh, depending on that view, the Council of Ministers will decide on negotiations. I mean, I'm general view. Cannot do of the terms of the treaty and uh, vocation of the community. You can't sit back and say uh, we're going to keep countries like Austria and Sweden out. You can argue about the terms and the timing, but you can't say uh, we're too busy. It's too complicated. You've got to stay out. I and mean, that's not a possible stance. Foreign Secretary, we said we'd release you by quarter to five, and it's one minute away. Would you just care in the last sixty seconds <laughs> to? Uh, give us a little summary of what you think the really key objectives, let's say the three key objectives you and your colleagues want to secure at this next European Council are going to be. We want to get a clear European up-to-date statement on the go. Uh, we want to get, at any rate, the, some essential decision-taking on the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, help for, though I think there will need to be a further week after that. We want to get the two IGCs off to a harmonious start. I mean, let the trumpets blow by all means and let the work begin, but not in a way and not in a spirit which makes the success of the work in doubt. I think we should get those objectives. Thank you very much. Well, Secretary, these are momentous tasks ahead of you, and we in this committee certainly wish you well and most. Uh, undoubtedly wish to thank you very much indeed for your prolonged but very clear exposition of complex issues. Thank you very much. Thank you.